Welcome back. Well, since today is Sunday, I'm sure some of you, perhaps even most of you, were expecting a project video, but I do not have a project video for you today. And there are two reasons for that. One, my life is in chaos today. And two, my haul videos have just been getting completely out of hand. The last one was just about an hour. So I need to do something about that. So we're going to try this week and do uh, the why this and not that in two parts. So today is going to be why this and then tomorrow will be and not that. So stick around and we'll get into it. my life in chaos. Uh, my refrigerator died three weeks ago and they were supposed to deliver a refrigerator a couple of days later, um, which is good because when you have a dead refrigerator, you need a new one. But it's Pennsylvania, it's November. So you haul the stuff out of the refrigerator, stick it into a box, stick the box on the patio. And believe me, it's frozen solid by the next morning. So it wasn't really the end of the world but there was a mistake in the delivery so it didn't get delivered a few days later and it got rescheduled for the following weekend but then the delivery truck broke down so it didn't get delivered the following weekend and finally it got delivered today and unfortunately even though the refrigerator is fine uh, the delivery people did some damage to the storm door and the cat does not like the new refrigerator uh, he didn't like the men coming to his house to deliver a refrigerator and not pet a cat. That that seems to be his criteria for entry into the home. Are you here to pet the cat? Welcome. Otherwise, get out of my house. So the other thing that happened today was the new computer was delivered. And ordinarily, I don't have too much trouble with new computers being delivered. I, I'm pretty computer literate. Mm, but this... I'm going to have to read you these instructions because I really thought our Portuguese friends had written this. So let's see. Uh, ensure to plug in adapter prior to initial boot up. When booting up for the first time, it is recommended to set pass the connect to internet stage in order to accelerate boot time. Um, feature one, while power on PC in the windows, press FN plus Q, you could make an easy shift arming three different modes, quite intelligent performance. Like seriously, um, I'm really not sure what they were trying to say. And even though I have to say almost not quite. So for those of you who are not familiar, English as she is spoke, this was written by a couple of charming Portuguese gentlemen in 1855. They did not speak English, but they were arming their countrymen for their sojourn into America. Uh, this passage is entitled The Hunting. There is it, some game in this wood? Another time, there was plenty some black beasts and thin game, but the poachers have killed almost all. Load our guns. Look, a hare who run. Let do him to pursue for the hounds. It go oneself in the plunghead land. Yes, plunghead land. No idea. Hear that it rouse, let aim it, let make fire him. I have pulled down killed. Me, I have failed it, my gun have misfix. I see a hind. 
Let leave to pass away. Don't disturture it. If we kill nothing, we have not any venison. I do flatter me to bring at my cook at least a wild boar head. Yummy. Let renounce to the high venison. We have some mean already. I have heard that it is plenty partridges to these partridges this year. I have killed more than 30. Have you killed also some thrushes and some quails? Some one, and besides, two pheasants, a wild duck, three woodcocks, and a snipe. Here's certainly a very good hunting. Oh yeah, they are just going to send all the beasts fleeing in terror. So, let's take a look at what I picked up at Finders Keepers. That is that wonderful consignment shop that Jocelyn found off in Hanover. And they have a policy of reducing the price of items that have been around. So if something's been around for three weeks, they drop the price. And you can see it on the price tag. You know, as of 11.21, it'll be, you know, $3.90. And as of December 2nd, it'll be, you know, $2.45 and watch the prices drop. This is my receipt. I don't know if you can see it, but it is $16.59. So let me show you what $16.59 has bought me. I'm going to start with this. This is the star of the show. This is a beautiful Nortaki Bowl Nippon. Uh, we're 10 inches across, almost three inches high. And it's got this beautiful, classic Japanese pattern of cherry blossoms. Very, very Japanese, very restrained, very subtle. And there is moriage work on that. And that's something that I do want to address with you. Moriage, what is it? All right. First of all, moriage is not a French word, even though I use the French pronunciation because I find the Japanese pronunciation absolutely beyond my ability. Uh, Japanese is not pronounced the same way it looks in English. Uh, their, their syllables and their accents are, are just very, very different. I, I had a friend from Japan, Amy, and, and her last name was ordinarily pronounced by Americans as Mayakawa, which is kind of like what a Southerner says. Mayakawa is out in the pasture and somebody better get on out there and milk her. No, it's Mayakawa and very short, clipped little syllables. And we would read, because of the vowels and the consonant breaks, four syllables in that. But the way she pronounced it, it was really more like three. And so I stick with the French pronunciation, moriage, um, because I just can't handle the Japanese. The little stamens on this, uh, the little bits of white in the flowers, and the camera's trying to readjust for a close-up, are raised. It's little dots of raised paint. Or in this case, it's glaze, really. And it gives a three-dimensional effect, as if there were little pearls on the piece. That's pretty much what they are aiming for, a sort of jewel effect. And with a Japanese piece, you run your hand across. If you start to feel that, there's your moriage. Very, very popular. This is a great piece because... The gilding, and I'm sure you can see that. Um, I know the light's reflecting on it, but it's just perfect. So this was the star. This is a beautiful, beautiful piece. Um, this is the kind of bowl that somebody is going to put on their sideboard or their dinner table and probably not put food in it. Or if they do, it'll be a couple of pieces of fruit because they're going to want to show off the bowl. This is a bowl you display rather than use. 
Uh, so that was one of my uh, purchase items. Now, that $16.59 got me six separate uh, item sets of items, etc. So we're really looking at something in the range of about $3 and change per piece. So let me show you this because I got a lot of salt and pepper shakers and we've talked about this before. Salt and pepper shakers are highly collectible and people like them. And when you are dealing in salt and pepper shakers, for one thing, you pop something like this into a first class package and your shipping costs are under $5. Bang, easy as pie. You have the salt and pepper shaker collector market, and there are people who collect them. Salt and pepper shakers are the kinds of things that you could just go nuts collecting them. And, you know, they'll all fit on a cabinet shelf or, you know, in a dresser drawer or, you know, on the counter in your kitchen, whatever, wherever you want to display them. They're small, they're relatively inexpensive, and it's the sort of thing that people enjoy collecting. Now, this set of salt and pepper is very interesting because we have that classic Noritake design. We've talked about this before. We see this on a lot of the old Nippon pieces, but the Noritake artists, there was one in particular, um, uh, Honda, his name Honda, and they really elevated this to a fine art. Also, the gilding on the top of this is outstanding. There's no wear. And they're marked Japan. And they do not have their original corks, but that's okay because I get corks. I, I tend to buy corks for these things in abundance because I deal with a lot of salt and pepper shakers. But just as comparison, this is a Noritake salt shaker. So let me turn that around and try to angle it so you don't get the glare. You can see, especially when you compare the two, the difference. This is much more detailed, much more finely painted. Even in this very, very small size, you can tell. But let me show you a piece of, this is Noritake in a larger size so that you can see. Yeah, there we go. I'm getting rid of some of the glare now. All right, you see the tree, and as you can see, it's in a similar color range, but the quality is very, very different. Uh, this one is a high-quality piece of Noritake. It's got the green M in the wreath. Uh, green M is a very popular marking. Uh, the markings on this, a lot of collectors collect according to the markings. I want the green M or I want the red M or whatever. Uh, they, This is a really beautifully executed piece. This is not something that I got uh, this weekend. This was just something I wanted to show you by way of comparison. So, now we've got the salt and pepper shakers. Now, you may remember this lusterware set from the last time I was at Finders Keepers. So let me take these pieces off so I can show you the tray. It's a nice little lusterware tray. You see, it's got the, the traditional Noritake design. This is not a Noritake piece. The, the lusterware pieces were made after Noritake. So this is more modern. This probably would have been made in the 50s or 60s. And the work is not as fine, not as delicate. This set consisted of the little tray. And here, look, here's our little jam pot. And our little mustard potty. And that's how this came. Not very impressive. However, when I add 
the salt and pepper shakers to it. And they are not part of the set, no lusterware on the salt and pepper shakers at all, but the color range is the same. And here, let me take that off so you can see these pieces together. As you can see, there is no problem combining that with this set and actually turning it into something respectable, which is going to be the salt and pepper and the little jam and mustard, or if you're in Australia, the Vegemite and Marmite, although I, I think they want more Vegemite than you could stuff in one of these little containers. It's amazing. They're not a hungry people. They're really not. There's plenty of food in Australia. Why they go after Vegemite and Marmite is just beyond me. I, I have no idea. You know, I mean, it's probably like cattle ranchers out in the Midwest who go to McDonald's. It just makes no sense. So when I saw the salt and pepper shaker, I realized I wanted it so that I could fill out this set and turn it into something more saleable. Because like this, it's not, I mean, it's not that I couldn't sell it. Of course I could sell it. I wouldn't have bought it if I didn't think I could sell it but it's not going to be anywhere near the easy sell that this set is going to be. So that's another thing to keep in mind. Sometimes you find pieces, and in this case, they are all Japan. They are all from the same period, um, uh, the same historical period. In other words, 1950s, 1960s. They all have that Noritake design and the same color range the same level of quality in the execution, they were not intended to be a set, but they're going to work perfectly as a set, and it's going to be a much more saleable item. Not bad. It was a $3 and change investment to really up the saleability of some pieces I already had. So let's take a look at these. These are also Japanese salt and pepper shakers. This is more of a European style. Oh, here, move this over a little. Keep moving them the wrong way. I'm moving them out of the range of the camera. And very, very nice pieces. So, you know, let's get you over there. There we go. Um, nice little floral design, heavy porcelain. Again, Japan, one has the original cork, one does not. In all likelihood, I will remove the original cork and replace it with two new corks. I often do that because the corks do not hold up well over time. And if, if I'm selling this to someone, I really like the idea that they can actually use it. You know, they can... It's not just sitting on a shelf. These are nice pieces. At $3, they're easily going to sell for at least $12. So, yeah, good investment. Now, these little guys are more Japanese salt and pepper shakers. And in the mid-century are highly collectible. They are cute. They are whimsical. And when you find pieces like this, again, we're looking at multiple collector markets. You have the collectors who want salt and pepper shakers. You also have people that collect Southwestern items. Um, these are you know, beautiful little sort of Mexican gentlemen. They're, this is going to appeal right across the board to multiple tastes. Now, let me show you something about this. Um, oh, here, I'll show you this because it's actually interesting. Notice the bottoms. See how much bigger that bottom opening is on this one than this one. Very unusual, but that does happen with these things. A lot of people would look at this and say, oh, that, uh, that's plastic. That means it's modern. Well, they have these plastic stoppers in the bottoms of salt and pepper shakers as early as the very early 1960s. By the mid to late 60s, most of them did have plastic stoppers. So, yes, this is a way to tell it doesn't come from the 30s, but still definitely old, definitely vintage in this case, 
we're probably looking at 1960s. Um, it's still within that general range of mid-century, but don't be put off by the plastic. In some cases, you know, you flip a salt and pepper shaker and you look at the plastic and say, ooh, that's new. In this case, no, they're old and you can tell. So we have yet another set. And this is uh, chicken, rooster and chicken. I'm not quite sure which is which. Well, that's the rooster and that's the chicken. When I say I'm not sure which is which, I mean in terms of salt and pepper shakers. Original corks, in all likelihood, I will leave these original corks in place because they are original, they're in good shape, and original corks is something that people want, uh, especially if they are collecting because you know they're going for more vintage pieces. Uh, these, again, multiple collectible markets because you've got salt and pepper and people collect chickens and roosters. I'm not sure why. They do. So, multiple markets. And the final set that I grabbed, it's very interesting. Let's start with this. Look, a little spoon. Now, I'm going to set that spoon down. Another spoon. This spoon does not go with this set. Um, this was sold as a five-piece set, but I can tell for two reasons this spoon doesn't go. The edge is gilded. And the other thing, which is hard to see on that little spoon, but I think you're going to be better able to see on a larger piece, is this is that rice pattern. And we've talked about this before. Uh, the legend, or um, legend, I guess, is that they embedded grains of rice into the porcelain. Let's see if you can see that. Yes. Okay. I think you can see that fairly well. They embedded grains of rice into the porcelain, and the rice was burnt off when they fired the porcelain. That is not so. And I mentioned this before, and someone pointed out that Sui didn't tell us how they did it. Well, how they did it is they carved these little rice grain shapes out of the porcelain, and then they put a clear glaze in there. And if you run your hand across it, you can actually feel all of the, the, um, the indentations. It's, this is not a smooth surface across here. The glaze fills the little holes, and it's, it's translucent. If you run your hand across, you can clearly see the shadow of your hand through the little rice grain pieces. But it's not true. They didn't really use grains of rice. They just cut out the shapes and said, grains of rice. So this set is uh, a rice bowl. We've got two little sauce bowls. And it's very nice. And this is, uh, it says made in China on all of this stuff. And then we have the spoon. It's, okay, there we go. I got it just right so the light's not interfering. You can see the little grain of rice pattern in the bowl of the spoon. This is similar, but as I say, it's not a match. Um, there's, it's just a little different. But remember, we've, and we've talked about this before too. Blue and white patterns are incredibly common in Chinese porcelain. They really, really went crazy for blue and white. It's just a strong color combination for them. So there's no problem finding blue and white anything. And in this case, an extra spoon got stuck in there. So I uh, got the five pieces for $3 and change, the, the two spoons, the rice bowl, and the two sauce bowls. And I think all in all, that was an especially good deal. Um, 
I will keep the four pieces that are set together. Um, I believe I have a couple of other rice grain pattern pieces. I may take them all out and see if, if there's something that, that could be combined as a larger set. But this little bugger here. Oops. Don't worry, it's not broken. This one is going to be handled separately because it's not part of this set. And it would be very disappointing for someone to buy this in the hopes that they were getting two little rice grain spoons and, in fact, only getting one. So that was what I got at Finders Keepers. I have a lot of pictures of things that I just passed up. For example, when I got that really pretty Noritake bowl, there were bowls all over the place there. German bowls, Bavarian bowls. No, the Noritake bowl was the valuable piece. And just before we finish this off, I do want to throw that out in closing. Why I buy Japanese and Chinese porcelain is because this is where the bargains are right now. For a long time, the bargains had been in European porcelain because American collectors didn't necessarily know one from another. Um, they, they would recognize Staffordshire or Spode or the, the big, big companies, but American collectors really didn't have a good sense of European porcelain. That changed. And now the European porcelain is going up in price. The Japanese and Chinese porcelain pieces are still very low priced. They have their own collector market, uh, especially things like Occupied Japan. Occupied Japan pieces have a strong collector market and they have for a long period of time. And when you consider that Occupied Japan uh, when we speak of that as a time period, it was only seven years out of all of Japanese history. Tiny little sliver of Japanese history that we can absolutely document. Late 40s, um, like 45, the end of the war to 1952. Um, that has always had its own strong collector's market. The collector's market for Asian porcelain is always going to be good. But people's understanding of it hasn't quite caught up. So you can still get massive bargains. Now, tomorrow, when we take a look at what I passed up, you're going to have a chance to see some pieces that are um, Japanese and Chinese porcelain, but modern. Pieces I just walked away from and said, no, you know, that's a piece from, you know, last Tuesday or maybe, you know, uh, the 1990s that is not interesting to me because it's either not as well made as earlier pieces or because it doesn't have the same collector's value or because the price they're charging in the stores is right about on target with what the piece is worth. So, meantime, things like this Noritake salt and pepper shakers. Oh, yeah, you, you see that, you grab that up. Um, the kitschy, you know, like this, Japanese, yeah, they will sell. And I don't have any trouble selling these. As I, as I say, they're, they are small. They are um, easy for collectors to handle. So we will see about this next week, or I'm sorry, tomorrow when we finish up the video. Next week, hopefully we will get back to a project video. I say hopefully because I'm hoping for a much more quiet weekend than I have this week so that I can set up a project for you. And I'll do it in the kitchen and you'll get a chance to see the new black refrigerator that the cat hates. Meantime, have a great day. I'll see you tomorrow.